the doors. Yes. Ah, good. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to start this uh, strict timing. I don't want to keep you all from uh, lunch. I understand that that's uh, probably the highest priority at the moment. <laughs> if, um, if you guys don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Um, I'm going to be talking about immersion optimized IT platforms, uh, immersion optimization for IT equipment, enterprise platforms, um, and everything that we do around this topic with Asperitas. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, a lot of the things that we do, uh, we also do within OCP, um, or within the immersion group. Uh, of ACS. Now, before I get into the actual IT side of things, uh, just for the people who are still unfamiliar with our technology, we have a booth downstairs where we have a system live where we, demo where, where we can demonstrate this technology. Um, I won't spend too much time on the technology introduction since most, I, I see a lot of familiar faces anyway, and there's other presentations that you can look up on the OCP uh, website as well on this. Um, one thing that is new is that we'll be launching soon uh, a 21 inch version of a system uh, and our technology is unique in a way that we are using passive immersion technology so we are relying on natural convection with single phase liquids um, and not just any liquids we're using uh, hydrocarbons technically oil um, and with our developments, we've also been able to drastically increase the power densities that we can support. So without changing the oil, without changing the technology, and this may sound odd, but it all comes down to the way that we position uh, our data or specifications because we only use data that we have actually been able to validate and that we've been able to prove. Uh, and we've been able to increase our power densities to approximately 43 kilowatts. Uh, especially with the upcoming 21 inch system that is going to be uh, uh, higher in power capacity. Um, some of you may be aware, and if you're not, uh, here's the news. Recently there was uh, uh, a press release about the investment that Shell did in Asperitas. Uh, that is on one side related to liquids development, which we're doing together with Shell, uh, and on the other hand also related to uh, new energies which my colleague Wim will be presenting on this afternoon, so I s strongly recommend uh, going into that session as well. Um, but the reason why I, need, why I think it's valuable to mention this is that we, together with Shell, we're looking at optimizing liquids for this purpose as well, which will allow us to eventually, on our roadmap, uh, keep on going with increasing these power densities. And the good news is that's not just for Asperitas. This is for the entire market. Uh, so the liquids, Shell is a large global provider, and these liquids will be available for the entire industry. Um, now, on our technology, um, a lot of our technology is focused on integration of elements that are needed for high availability of IT equipment. Uh, that means our technology is, uh, is equipped with full electrical integration, rack level switch gear, power distribution, uh, the cooling uh, infrastructure is integrated, including all the thermal management and safety features. Um, everything is focused on containment uh, with dual hull uh, level, mo level management or level monitoring of the liquid levels, uh, cable management, thermal. Uh, Serviceability, IoT optimization, everything is part of the offering that Asperitas has positioned in the market. Uh, and this is something that we take seriously. Uh, for us, this is an important thing. We've done a lot of research in the past on, wha on what, is, uh, what are limitations, what are challenges when you want to adopt liquid cooling or immersion cooling in this, uh, in this case. Um, and these are drivers behind our technology development. Another factor that we are very highly focused on is the optimization of infrastructures within data centers um, and the level of safety that can be applied. Uh, and all the features for this are built into the technology and can be uh, utilized in any 
way that uh, that it's required. Eh? So if there is a requirement for thermal optimization, as in maximizing the temperature output of a system, which is a very relevant um, uh, value if you're considering heat reuse. Eh? The higher the temperature, the more value you, you are creating. Uh, and that is something that the system can automatically and completely fully autonomously can, uh, uh, can manage and control. And if it's all about uh, keeping the lowest possible temperatures, which is a completely different perspective or a different uh, way of working with cooling infrastructures and optimization, and that's also something that the system can, auto can autonomously manage. So we are very active as well in the public domain, uh, in the industry platforms. Uh, we're aligning up, uh, we're contributing and talking in the ASHRAE calls, we're active in OCP, and we do all this with a lot of, uh, well first of course with a lot of passion, but also with a lot of interest in maturing the industry and creating a larger industry and, get and increasing the adoption rate. Um, and part of that strategy is also about, uh, to investigate, to develop uh, entirely new concepts that come up when you start looking at immersion. Uh, so liquid cooling is one thing. Immersion is a subdivision of liquid cooling. And it has some very unique properties, which are, in essence, very interesting, or at least worth consideration for a lot of customer deployments, for a lot of data center environments. Um, one of these things is temperature chaining, which is basically fundamentally an energy cascade. This morning, uh, in the earlier presentation, we were looking at the rear coolers. Just now, we were looking at cold plates. Uh, talking about immersion right now. And all these technologies can actually operate in synergy within the same data center environment. Actually, there is a lot of value in combining the technologies in a data center environment. Um, an energy cascade can be created by, for example, using the thermal output of a radar cooled rack uh, of the radar cooler, radar heat exchanger, and using that as an input temperature, as an input supply for uh, a cold plate solution or an immersion system. And by doing so, you're actually increasing the temperature difference across your entire water circuit, which especially when everything is focused on free cooling capabilities or perhaps adiabatic cooling, you can drastically increase uh, the efficiency of the entire cooling setup. Uh, but another fundamental thing, uh, the, the temperature chaining and energy cascade is something that we've been talking about for a few years already. Um, but the dielectric ride-through is something that is, that is being discussed today. Um, and ride-through, the term ride-through is not as well spread, uh, not, not very spread, spread around yet. Um, and I'd like to go a little bit into that in the next slide as well. Um, right through actually is the effect that when a chiller installation or a cooling installation fails, that a technology can still work for a while based on the buffer that liquid uh, may offer. Uh, if a pump fails with a cold plate solution, there is only a very small amount of liquid that you can access for this effect. But with an immersion system, if a pump fails, there is still a bath full of liquid, which can be a buffer to, capture, to keep on capturing thermal energy from the IT equipment and allow a longer lifetime, a longer operating time. Um, and these, are, these actually f can be factored into a facility design or a platform design, which especially when it comes to um, uh, high availability implementations can be of tremendous value. Um, I'll get back to that point on the, on the next slide with an example as well. Um, but a lot of the principles behind liquid cooling that are quite new to the industry are already being put into, practi in pr into practice. Uh, um, a live example in the UK, for example, is Cool DC. Um, they have literally built everything that around specifically for liquid. They're able to redirect liquid infrastructures and reorganize uh, the way that liquid is distributed through the facility through different type of cooling setups. Uh, Bytesnet is currently working on, uh, uh, on a new layout for the facility based on these kind of principles as well. And the Asperitas Lage Weide pro project, which 
my colleague Wim will be, will be presenting this afternoon, actually utilizes, uh, maximizes the benefits of such an approach by uh, creating full synergy. And that means the energy that goes in comes out as heat with almost without losses. Now, as promised, the ride through, uh, an example of ride through in this case, this is something that we um, uh, shared within the TC909 uh, group uh, for the upcoming, for the announced white paper for the impact of liquid in the data center industry. And what this illustrated, this was an actual scenario that ran in our facility. Um, after a chiller failure, uh, in our facility, we have a lot of different server systems with uh, very different specs running together in one immersion system that we use for R&D purposes. Um, and at the point in time, we had some uh, limitations set on our system, which exceeded the specifications of a few servers, which actually provided us with a very interesting analysis after that chiller failure. Uh, what you're looking at here on the left is, is a table that describes, that gives a very s small description of what type of servers were inserted at the point in time. The overall power load was slightly over 10 kilowatts at the time. Not, not a crazy load, but it's decent, right? And the cooling supply, uh, as you can see here, the first red dot uh, is slightly above 40 degrees Celsius. For us, that is a normal operating temperature. Uh, it's a temperature that we start all validations on. Uh, what you can see here is a chiller failure at time point zero. Uh, and what happened to the system after that? Now I have to explain there's a very small water circuit that keeps on circulating, uh, which we would call a facility uh, ride through, because that is a water circuit that still keeps pumping but the liquid in, this, in the water circuit then, ha then becomes a small buffer as well. That buffer is relatively small, um, and that can be seen as well by the rising line. So the red line is the water return temperature, the blue line is the water input temperature. So what you notice is that uh, at the very first stage, after about approximately 15 minutes, the water input temperature has reached the same temperature as the output temperature was at the starting point. But if you look at the actual oil temperature, um, the gray line is the oil temperature in the bottom of the tank, and the yellow line is the oil temperature in the top of the tank. What you're seeing is that those lines take some time to adjust to this new cooling environment. Um, essentially, at some point, where after that 15 minutes, the uh, water circuit has stopped being a cooling mechanism, a cooling supply. So the facility right through in this example, you could state that that was about 15 minutes. Um, the very first system that failed was at around 20, uh, was, uh, approximately on the, on the 20 minute mark. And that was a 12 GPU system that has a temperature tolerance of 36 degrees Celsius cooling supply. So technically, during the start of this uh, scenario, the environment was already too hot for that system. Uh, so that system has failed uh, when the cooling temperature, when the, uh, when the, when the cooling temperature reached 50 degrees Celsius, uh, approximately. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, that's when it started uh, failing. Well, it's not a full failure. It's just it throttled down. Uh, it stopped working with its GPUs. Uh, it did a couple of reboot cycles after that, which you can see a bit further on uh, at around the half, uh, half hour mark. It did a reboot cycle, the power dropped, power increased, it w tried to ramp up its GPUs, but it failed. Uh, and then it kept idling and uh, eventually failing. But if you look at the overall system, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's approximately 50 minutes. Um, some of the Intel CPUs that we were uh, validating in the system uh, started throttling, started throttling down. Uh, basically, what it did is it got out of turbo mode. Uh, in our, uh, with superior cooling technologies, CPUs usually uh, run into turbo continuously. Uh, it happens automatically. So these uh, CPUs started running into the maximum tolerances. 
And eventually what happens is that uh, if you look at the top marks here, this is uh, what our system does is uh, send out automatic uh, uh, alerts. Uh, there's uh, different levels of alerting. And if you ignore alerts long enough, eventually it will escalate into a critical failure. And that's when the system will start protect, uh, will engage the safety mechanisms which are designed to protect the IT equipment. Uh, and what you can see in this example is that uh, at one hour uh, and approximately 10 minutes, these safety systems have been engaged. So the actual write-through event in this case, with a system that was already running above its thermal spec for the IT that is sitting within, was actually approximately one hour and 10 minutes before the automatic safety features engaged. But no real server, the, the, the servers have not been damaged, the servers have not switched themselves off, the CPUs have not triggered a shutdown of a system. So everything has been uh, within operating parameters through up, up above the operating parameters, but not above critical parameters throughout the entire event. Now, this is something that we can actually calculate and design into an IT platform. So a high availability solution can, act can actually be designed for, uh, a, for a dielectric write-through. Okay, in case of immersion, the buffer capabilities of the immersion liquid is something that can be factored in. Now, the, onto the IT platform design, and this, is the, uh, this, is the, uh, this content is also part of, uh, currently part of the contributions into the IT, gears IT Gear white paper, which is announced for the next global summit. And this is uh, a view on why, uh, on what should be done to ensure a long lifetime of IT equipment. Uh, I will end this with a couple of concepts that we have developed uh, and that, we've, uh, that we are developing and evaluating together with uh, our manufacturing partners. Um, and the basis of this is that you cannot assume that every IT will always be compatible with liquid. And this is something that where there is a lot of confusion about in the industry. Um, in order to make, life, to make it easier for the market to adopt immersion technology, there are, uh, uh, there are different ways of presenting information. Um, you can never assume that an IT configuration will be fully compatible with liquid until you've actually tested it. Um, it's not rocket science, it's not difficult, it's also not very scary, to be honest. It's just a little bit of homework that needs to be done before any system uh, can be qualified as immersion ready. Another aspect of our design uh, angle is that thermal optimization will increase the lifetime of the IT for very simple reasons. It's, re it's relevant for liquid flow to make sure that liquid flows in a predictable matter, a manner, um, which will reduce failures based on material compatibility, based on uh, thermal properties, thermal capabilities, and electrical safety. Um, and that which will eventually um, deliver a system which uh, suffers less from thermal shock. If you design something thermally well, uh, the very fast temperature fluctuations that we're used to in air environments uh, are drastically reduced. Um, and if you design it well, it actually opens the door to a whole new range of possibilities. Now, yesterday morning during the opening notes, there were a lot of references to Moore's Law, how that's declining, how that's slowing down. Some people argue that it's already invalidated. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Some people claim it's still there. Well, if anything, at the very least, whatever is there in Moore's Law, and if we want to maintain that line, that gradient, it has to be done uh, in other ways than just adding the, transistor, the amount of transistors per square millimeter or uh, so the, the, the density on the chip. With liquid, we can actually do this. Uh, so for one of the examples of the things that we've been doing uh, in terms of uh, evaluating possibilities is that we've been running uh, one of the AMD EPIC uh, chips 
Uh, we've ran them stable at 318 watts, which is twice the amount of power that they've been designed for. And we've been able to, to do that st stable with 40 degrees Celsius cooling and with tolerance, with a lot of to temperature tolerance left. Uh, the, so the limitation was not the cooling capability, the limitation was the stability of the CPU and everything around it. And this is something that you can actually start designing for. Um, another thing that we work with is uh, optimized immersion chassis, which are chassis that are fully designed for optimized liquid flow, um, and which can uh, which actual, actually tackle a couple of challenges related to immersion technology. I'm, I'm noting the time, so I need to rush a little bit. Um, during the uh, uh, during a certification process or a validation process for immersion, um, there's a couple of steps that we undertake. Which is, uh, and the first step is simply paperwork, to just to establish viability of for immersion of a system, uh, and we test, uh, we create a test build, we create prototypes together with manufacturers. This is something that we do together with the manufacturers. We work with engineering samples that we receive from manufacturers. Uh, very often, sadly, the work is also covered under NDA. For us, that is not a problem because for the aim for us is to, to help the IT manufacturers in designing for liquid. This is not a job that we should be doing, right? So this is something that we do along the way to make sure that the manufacturers will be able to do it. And eventually, for a full certification process, we do a long-term duration test as well. And long-term, in our uh, terminology, means three months, or two and a half months, to be precise, 10 weeks, uh, in, which we, uh, in which we evaluate the system. So there's a lot of things that we do in this. The system undergoes some very, very tough processes, uh, both mechanical but and thermal. The system overheats. Uh, we completely disassemble and reassemble the systems. Uh, uh, we usually filter out problems that actually m relate to the, to the original manufacturer and that may have nothing to do with immersion. Uh, we very often notice some of those as well in this process, which is an indication of how strict this process is. Now, we're doing this work also together with some of the OCP members for OCP partners within OCP. Uh, and with those, we are aiming at some pretty disruptive new ways of designing IT uh, and a lot of non-disruptive stuff. Yeah, so first of all, we already have developed a high-density CPU environment based on both Intel and AMD CPUs. Uh, with the largest system that we're developing, we're looking at uh, uh, adding uh, additional capacity for 24 more nodes with, uh, with a minimal uh, physical expansion of the system. Um, with GPU systems, we've already uh, done installations with very high quantities of, of GPUs. Uh, but especially when it comes to AI, we're looking at uh, 48 node uh, systems with 192 uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Obviously, we're looking, mostly looking at the higher power rating. Uh, one of the more important, uh, one of the more, imp uh, one of the latest developments that we're looking at is MVM storage. Um, currently, the solutions that we have are very basic based on air design systems that we've re-engineered and that we've optimized for liquid together with the manufacturers. Um, but we also do make a lot of design concepts. As in, okay, so what if you were to design these type of technologies for immersion specifically? Uh, one of these concepts, we come up at uh, around uh, 2,000 NVMs, which results in 40 kilowatts of NVM storage, which is quite impressive to achieve with NVMs because they are very, uh, uh, very good on, uh, very efficient on power. Uh, but these type of platforms will make a lot of difference in how far you can go with integration of uh, different workloads. And we're doing all these, as mentioned, we're doing all these developments together with our partners, uh, either 
they sponsor or they supply or they work closely together with us. Uh, I cannot always elaborate on these type of partnerships. Uh, some of them I can, and the ones that, uh, what I can say is, uh, is on here. <laughs> um, so we've been working with 10G Tech and Leone. Leone is, some, is a company that we've mentioned several times as well uh, in previous events uh, on optimizing for immersible optical cabling. Uh, it's, an, it's one of the limitations with immersion technology that optical cabling is not very suitable to immerse. Uh, we're working on immersion liquids together with Shell to optimize those and to increase the barrier, uh, to, to get past uh, the current uh, density figures and to, in to increase those and to get to the next level as well. Um, and we're working with IT equipment providers uh, here in, within OCP with WeWin and Dell and Penguin and Supermicro is also one of our partners. There's more. Uh, but more with more strict NDAs applied. Um, we're working on this storage angle together with an undisclosed partner. Um, but we're looking for more and more partners to work with on these platforms. There is a lot to be gained when you're looking at, when you're developing for immersion. Uh, but to access this, we need to work together with manufacturers who can take, take on these efforts. CPU evaluations we do with, uh, uh, with the materials that we receive from the CPU manufacturers. Some CPU vendors are actually partnering with us on, on these kind of things. So the point is, in order to get this liquid technologies to a new level, we need to get, make sure that the IT equipment is going to be able to benefit from the new capabilities of embracing liquid. And that's what we're starting to do within ACS, together, uh, so far together with Steve Mills, but uh, he's, uh, he's, he's moving up the chain to the incubation committee, I, I learned. <laughs> sad to see you go. Uh, sad, sad, well, you're still there, but... Uh, <laughs> we're looking for partners that are willing to take the next step and make sure that these platforms are going to be developed properly. We're not an IT manufacturer, we're not an IT developer, we're not even an IT trader. We don't sell IT, we don't trade in it. So all this work we hand over, we aim to hand over to our partners. Right? So if you want to work with us on these and use the technology that we can jointly develop uh, to bring it, uh, by bringing it into uh, OCP, contact us, come and work with us on these. Um, and every third Thursday, uh, every third Tuesday of the month, we're having the OCP immersion call uh, for the community, the community call. So join that. Please join that. Join the cold plate solutions as well. Join the rear dog uh, talks as well. And help us all get OCP to this new liquid level. That's, um, thank you. Not sure if there is any time for questions if you're desperate for lunch, but if you would like to ask some questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Everybody's desperate for lunch. I guess. Everybody, everybody <laughs> wants lunch. We are starting back up at 1.30. Yep. Uh, just a quick reminder. So we'll be back in here at 1.30 for uh, Rack and Power, and I think Alibaba has uh, their immersion story, I think.